There are nearly 20,000 Caldo Assyrians in France. 10,000 of them live near Paris around Sarcelles. They are political refugees who have arrived from Turkey, Iraq, Syria or Iran for 30 years. They speak Aramaic, the language spoken by Christ. They have inherited a Christianity which developed separately from that of Rome. Their ancestors were the first to evangelize India, China and Mongolia. When on the point of outnumbering the Western Christians, they fell victim to terrible massacres and were almost exterminated. In Sarcelles, as elsewhere, the Caldo Assyrians live in a close-knit community. Here they've built their own Chaldean church. You are amongst the oldest Christian denominations in the world. History, economic circumstances, Politics meant that you were forced to leave your country. And you find yourselves here, in a country where Christianity is younger than yours. A country that was evangelized two centuries, three centuries after yours. You are therefore, in a manner of speaking, our ancestors. And when you arrive here, you are not foreigners. Until now, you were guests. Guests that came and went, who passed through. But now that this church has been built, this is your country, because this is your church. They have maintained the rural traditions of their mountain villages and continue to make not only their own bread, but also their cheese, which has always been a staple part of their diet. When we came to France, we were asked, who are the Caldo Assyrians? But when we start to tell our story, that we are descendants of the Sumerians, the Akkadians, the Babylonians, people said, ah, you are from Iraq. When we answered, no, we are Mesopotamians. We come from Mesopotamia, but we are not Iraqi. We are from the southeast of Turkey. Then they say, so, you are Muslims. To which we answer, no, we are Catholic Christians. There are still Christians in Turkey. And furthermore, we have inherited the language of Jesus. We still speak Aramaic to this day. The Caldo Assyrians are originally from Mesopotamia, a region between the Tigris and the Euphrates. Today, this part of the world is shared between Iraq, Turkey and Syria. Their history began around Ur, more than 3,000 years BC. It was there that the Sumerians invented writing, mathematics and the wheel. According to the Bible, it was from there that Abraham, the father of Jews, Christians and Muslims, set out. The Caldo Assyrians of Sarcelles are proud of their ancient roots in these lands and say they are the descendants of all the peoples of this region. This ancient Sumerian civilization gave birth to numerous city-states ruled by priest kings who fought continuously between themselves. However, despite these conflicts, all the peoples of Mesopotamia shared the same culture and numerous gods. Almost a thousand years BC, two towns dominated Mesopotamia, 
Babylon on the Euphrates, and especially Nineveh, capital of the Assyrians, on the Tigris. It was around this period that the Aramean tribes emerged from the Syrian desert. At first, the Arameans were simple nomads whose way of life was very similar to that of the Bedouins today. But their language was to gain a considerable importance throughout this area. It is a version of this language which is spoken today in Sarcel. Little by little, they abandoned their nomadic lifestyle and started to settle on cultivated lands and mix with local populations, forming several small kingdoms. We only know about the Arameans from the annals of the Assyrian kings. And so it's only from an outside source that we first hear of them. And they are a people who are causing trouble to the uh, Assyrian Empire. And it's not until a few centuries later, that's to say the uh, round about uh, 10th century BC, that we have the first Aramaic inscriptions. And th this was a period when it, throughout the whole of North Mesopotamia, there was a, a power vacuum um, allowing these small uh, town kingdoms to uh, emerge in different places, in Aleppo, in Homs, Hama, and so on, and Damascus. And this was the great period of the Aramean kingdoms. The art and religion of the Arameans were influenced by the cultures with which they were in contact, those of Phoenicia, Lebanon today, and above all, of the powerful Assyria. Many Mesopotamian divinities were worshipped by all the peoples of the Middle East. Like, for example, the Mesopotamian sun god, Shamash, his four-branched star decorates the modern Caldo-Assyrian flag. Some of these kings are mentioned in the Bible, Hazael and others, and caused a lot of trouble to the Israelites as well as to the Assyrians. And eventually the Assyrians uh, moved westwards and conquered all these uh, kingdoms. Damascus fell finally in 732. From that time on, the Assyrians dominated the whole region, from Babylon to Egypt, mixing the peoples by forced deportations while amassing the riches of the whole empire in their capital city, Nineveh. Two languages and two different types of writing remained, that of the Arameans, which was very simple, based on an alphabet, and the Akkadian language, that of the Assyrians, a great deal more complicated and based on cuneiform characters. To write Akkadian, you had to have a long training because you had to learn all the cuneiform signs and the huge number of these, whereas Aramaic was much easier to write because you only have 22 letters, 22 symbols, and for this reason, Aramaic became uh, more and more used even in the late Assyrian, uh, late Neo-Assyrian, late New Babylonian empires. It is therefore the simpler system of Aramaic writing which was to be adopted by all the peoples of Mesopotamia. In Babylon, near the biblical Tower of Babel, the Chaldeans, one of the Aramean tribes, took power and eventually crushed the Assyrians in 612 BC. They then seized Jerusalem and deported the Jews to Babylon. The Arameans, Babylonians and Assyrians merged to such an extent that it became impossible to tell them apart. However, in 539 BC, the Persians conquered the whole of Mesopotamia. The Assyrian and Chaldean empires disappeared forever. Surprisingly, the Persians renounced their own language and adopted Aramaic as their official tongue. They then freed the Jews, who returned to Jerusalem, spreading Aramaic to Palestine. For a thousand years, the whole of the Middle East spoke this language, which was used to write many passages of the Bible. 
In the second and first century BC, a whole lot of Aramaic dialects uh, manifested themselves in inscriptions, and Palmare is by one, perhaps the most dramatic of these. Uh, it's right out in the desert. It was a caravan city which built up its trade uh, because it traded down with Mesopotamia, southern Mesopotamia, and much, and Egypt. Uh, it was a very lucrative trade, often of incense and uh, luxury items. And uh, they put up inscriptions in Palmyra honoring people who had made these uh, rather dangerous uh, caravan trips down to the Gulf and so on. These inscriptions are in a particular Aramaic script, particular to Palmyra, and uh, they are often in combination with Greek inscriptions. The following century saw the birth of Christianity, which developed in Syria, the Roman Empire, and Mesopotamia. <laughs> Well, Christianity was born in Palestine, where the main language spoken was Aramaic, and Jesus will certainly have spoken Aramaic. And uh, we know uh, early Christianity through the Greek New Testament, written in Greek, but the oral traditions, earliest oral traditions, will have been in Aramaic. And <clears throat> uh, it's uh, important to remember that there must have been a large Aramaic-speaking uh, um, Christian expansion to the East. In the southeast of modern-day Turkey, in Edessa, capital of one of the first kings to convert to Christianity, Syriac appeared. This Aramaic dialect became the literary language of Christians in the Persian and the Eastern Roman empires. A new alphabet was created. It became the basis of the Aramaic language spoken by all Caldo-Assyrians today. <laughs> The Christians of Edessa founded the Church of the East, close to Babylon, at Seleucia Stesiphon, in the Persian Empire. Due to continuous wars between Romans and Persians, this church became isolated and progressively lost contact with the Roman Christian Church. At this time in Roman Syria, Christianity had become the official religion. Debates on the nature of Christ took place throughout the Middle East. How can one be human and God at the same time? On one hand, Bishop Nestorius of Constantinople distinguished clearly between the human and the divine nature in Christ. He taught that Mary was not the mother of God, but only the mother of Jesus, the Christ. On the other hand, Cyril, Bishop of Alexandria, taught the unity of natures above all divine. The crisis was so serious that the Roman Emperor convoked a council in Ephesus in 431 AD. The theories of Cyril gained the upper hand. Nestorius was deposed and died in exile. His followers escaped from the Roman Empire and found refuge within the Church of the East, which cut all ties with Rome and Constantinople. They were called the Nestorians. Twenty years later, at the Council of Chalcedony, the Roman Emperor accused the heirs of Cyril of having overlooked the human nature of Christ. They also left the official Roman Church, but remained in Syria. They are called the Syriacs. From this time, these two Christian communities, although divided, continue to speak Aramaic. Their descendants today are the Caldo Assyrians. <laughs> It was in monasteries such as Salah in the Tur Abdin that the Syriac patriarchs sheltered for centuries. Here, the chants and prayers of early Christianity were preserved, far from the influence of Latin or Greek.
From 630 AD, Muslim Arabs invaded the Middle East. The Nestorians had been oppressed by the Persians as the Syriacs by the Roman Byzantines. They welcomed the arrival of the Arabs, who rapidly established an empire which extended from India to Spain. The Nestorians and Syriacs knew the Arabs well. For centuries, there were numerous churches in Arabia, and many Arab tribes were Christian. This Islam, which recognized Jesus and the prophets, did not frighten them. Peace reigned in the region, and prosperity returned for all. For centuries, the majority of the population of the Middle East remained Christian and continued to speak their language, Aramaic, freely. At Damascus, the first capital of this Arab empire, the Mosque of Omeyyad illustrates the meeting of these cultures. On this site, there first stood a temple to the Aramean god Hadad. Then the Romans transformed it into a temple for Jupiter. At the end of the fourth century AD, the temple became a church dedicated to Saint John the Baptist. When the Muslims arrived in 636 AD, the Christians shared this place of worship with them. Their collaboration was so close that Christian artisans were often known to build and decorate Muslim monuments. It was only in 705 AD that this church was finally transformed into a mosque. Slowly, Islam and the Arabic language prevailed. To speak Aramaic became synonymous with being a Christian. In 750 AD, a new dynasty, the Abbasids, took power and founded Baghdad on the Tigris. A great library was constructed which gathered together all the written knowledge of the time. It was visited by students from every country and of every religion. Towns like Samara, with its famous spiral minaret, were built everywhere. It was the golden age of the Arab Muslim civilization, where Muslims and Christians lived side by side. The Nestorians and Syriacs had knowledge of the ancient cultures and undertook the phenomenal work of translating texts from Greek to Aramaic, then to Arabic. It is thanks to them that the philosophy, mathematics, and medicine of the Greeks were not lost. This knowledge was brought to the West by Spanish Muslims three centuries later. The reputation of these Christians was such that the doctors of the caliphs were often Nestorian. From the first centuries AD, the Church of Mesopotamia was invested with a mission to spread the Christian message throughout the world. From the beginning, they moved toward the countries on the Asian continent. They left from the Eastern Mediterranean and spread the Christian message to Persia, Central Asia, Tibet, India, and China. By the 10th and 11th centuries, this church counted more than 60 million followers. It was the biggest church in the world, and I would say, the most important. Many Chinese, Indian, and Mongolian bishops and priests owed obedience to the patriarch of the church in Baghdad, a church which, at that time, was very prosperous. In 1623, the Jesuits discovered to their amazement that they were not the first Christians to enter China. At Xianfu, they found a stele written in Chinese and in Aramaic, proof that Nestorian monks were present in the country since the 7th century AD.
However, in 1258, the Mongols swept through Baghdad, massacring the Muslims and destroying the town. The contents of the great library were thrown into the Tigris. The Arab civilization crumbled. Because of ancient links established with the Mongol chiefs, the Christians were spared. The work in relief on the Syriac monastery of Mar Benham in northern Iraq dates from this period. Mongol monarchs came to bow down before the tomb of St. Benham, where there is a Turco-Mongol inscription which reads, that the peace of St. Benham, friend of God, comes down and rests on the Khan, his elders, and his wives. The Nestorian patriarch was himself an Asian and believed that Nestorianism would become the official religion of the empire. But in the end, the Mongols opted for Islam, thus putting an end to the hopes of the Arameans. At the end of the 14th century, Tamerlan, a fanatic Muslim from Central Asia, swept through Mesopotamia and massacred the Christians. The Nestorians escaped to the mountains, the home of the Kurds. As for the Syriacs, they found refuge in Tur Abdin, which means Mountain of the Worshippers of God, in what is today southeastern Turkey. There they cultivated the arid lands and lived in a close-knit community forgotten by all. The central Ottoman state of the day was not interested in these poor, withdrawn regions and thus left the Aramean population undisturbed. This apparent tranquility was, however, disturbed from time to time by raids carried out by surrounding Kurdish tribes. The Syriac villages were grouped around monasteries that were veritable fortresses, as at Mor Gabriel, the spiritual center of the region, and served as refuges when danger struck. <laughs> It was in these monasteries that the ancient manuscripts were preciously guarded and where the worshippers claimed to be the only authentic representatives of the genuine traditions of Christianity. Rome discovered their existence at the end of the Middle Ages. They were considered as lost sheep. It was decided to bring them back to the fold. Missionaries were ordered to place these schismatic Nestorians and Syriacs under the authority of the Pope. 
In exchange, they were offered material help and European diplomatic protection. The Pope named the Nestorians who rejoined Catholicism the Chaldeans. One of them, the monk Johanna Sulaka, rallied the Roman Church and became the first Chaldean Patriarch in 1553. He was assassinated two years later. From then on, all the Eastern churches were split between those who recognized the authority of Rome and those who refused it. Tensions ran very high. At the Rabban Hormes convent in the area of Mosul, those Nestorians hostile to the Pope continued to worship as before. In the 19th century, some Anglo-Saxon missionaries came to support them against Rome, and it was these missionaries who, influenced by archaeological findings, called them Assyrians. The Nestorians were divided into Assyrians and Catholic Chaldeans. The Syriacs were separated into Catholic Syriacs and Orthodox Syriacs. And in spite of this, they all continued to speak Aramaic. All these groups who first and foremost called themselves Christians started to claim a common ethnic identity under the name of either Assyrian or Caldo-Assyrian, or later Aramean. For the first time, they began to dream of a nation founded on a common language and on their ancient links with Mesopotamia. Nationalism started to emerge in this region of the Middle East at the beginning of the 19th century. Nationalism is a double-edged sword. It allows a community to affirm its existence, its nation, its identity. But once nationalism becomes radical, it leads to exclusion. Hence, Turkish nationalism, Arab nationalism, Persian nationalism, Kurdish nationalism, and even caldo assyrian nationalism ended up by distancing the communities from each other. And as a result, massacres carried out by the Ottoman Empire took place from 1842 to 1843 and particularly from 1895 to 1896, which sought to press the populations of the Ottoman Empire into one Turkish national mold. In November 1914, the Ottoman Empire entered the war on the side of Germany. On the Eastern Front, it used auxiliary Kurdish troops who knew the terrain well. The massacre of the Armenians began. The Assyrians, who lived in the inaccessible mountains, fought the Turks under the orders of Patriarch Mar Shimun XXI, their political and religious leader. Isolated, they fled towards Persia to fight on the side of the Russians. The general Petras led this small army and became their national hero. It was an important moment for this young nation. But in October 1917 came the Bolshevik Revolution. Abandoned by the Russians, they were left to be massacred by the Turkish army. The Assyrian Patriarch was assassinated by the Kurds. In the Tur Abdin, the Syriacs who had remained peacefully in their villages were exterminated as here in Mardin. This tragedy accounted for over a million deaths, and not only Armenians, but also Caldo-Assyrians of all faiths were massacred or died of hunger and exhaustion. After the war, the West redesigned the new borders of the Middle East. The old Ottoman Empire was reduced to Turkey. France inherited Syria, Great Britain had a mandate over Iraq, Jordan, and Palestine. The lands on which the Caldo Assyrians and Kurds had traditionally lived were divided between Turkey, Iran, Iraq, and Syria. Despite their promises, the Allies assigned them no territories. They took refuge in Iraq, and the men enlisted as auxiliary troops in the British Army to repress Kurd and Arab revolts. They were known as the Assyrian levies, 
In 1933, after becoming independent, the Iraqis decimated them in retaliation. Many escaped to Syria and even more to America. There are no more Nestorians in Turkey today. The church of Kocanes, the residence of the Assyrian Patriarch in 1915, now inaccessible in a zone held by the Turkish army, is one of the last traces of 15 centuries of presence. The last Chaldeans left for France in the 1980s. In 1900, nearly 30% of the population of Turkey was Christian. Nowadays, the number is less than 0.1%. Escaping from the war between the Turkish state and the Kurdish nationalists, the remaining Syriacs from Tur Abdin left for Sweden or Holland, and except for a few monasteries, the villages are empty. However, since the beginning of the 21st century, the Turkish government has started to change its attitude and has begun to recognize the existence of the Aramean population. Thus, in the monastery of Salah, where the Christians were massacred in 1915, some monks and nuns determined to ensure the survival of their culture teach it to the young people who still live there. <laughs> This symbolic renaissance has been entirely financed by the Western diaspora. Gifts have flooded in. Every summer, people come in their thousands from Europe to show their children the monastery of Deir el Zafaran and the country of their birth that they had been forced to leave. It is thanks to them that an Aramean presence now continues in Turkey. The management of this influx of tourists has become the principal activity of all the spiritual centers. In Iraq, Saddam Hussein required absolute submission from the Caldo Assyrians, considering them as Christian Arabs and recognizing only their religious identity. From the 50s on, they have moved to Baghdad. The Chaldeans have been here in Iraq since the first centuries of Christianity. This is our country. And all Chaldeans who are in this country still speak Chaldean, Aramaic, the language of the country, and the Aramaic language. Together with our families, we still speak Aramaic, the language of our Lord. We will stay here until the end, and the Lord will help us. Circumstances, war or other difficulties must not dissuade us. On the 1st of April 2002, when Saddam was still in power, something unthinkable for the Baghdad regime happened in the north. The Caldo Assyrians openly celebrated their New Year festival in the Kurdish zone of northern Iraq, a zone which Baghdad had not controlled since the Gulf War of 1991.
The political and religious leaders assembled there to talk about the future of their people and to welcome the Assyrian singer Linda George, arriving from the United States. In the spring of 2003, American and British troops invaded Iraq and ended the regime of Saddam Hussein. The Caldo Assyrians formed one of the principal minorities of the ethnic population in the Middle East. Approaching a million in number, they remain Christians in the middle of a Muslim majority and worry about their future in such an unstable region. In northern Iraq, just before the arrival of the Americans, the militants of the Assyrian Democratic Movement came down from the mountains of Kurdistan to protect the Christian villages which surround Mosul, formerly Nineveh, considering that these were part of their own territory. Established in 1979, this movement had been forbidden by Saddam, who had executed its founders. After the first Gulf War, it had been able to campaign openly, but only in the autonomous zone of northern Iraq. These militants, who are Chaldeans, Assyrians and Syriacs, all work together for the recognition of a caldo assyrian national identity, and not only a religious one. They've had several members in the Kurdish parliament and a minister of regional government. From 1991, they've developed something that they hope to extend to the rest of Iraq. For example, Dehok, a Christian town in this autonomous zone north of Mosul, has benefited from money raised worldwide by the Assyrian Aid Society in order to finance the reconstruction of villages destroyed by Saddam in his fight against the Kurds. It has also funded a number of primary and secondary schools. All subjects taught here are in Aramaic, and a considerable effort has been made to modernize and standardize the language. For the first time in 13 centuries, this language, considered dead by many, is taught in secular schools as a living language with its cultural and scientific identity. A generation ago, almost only the priests knew how to write it. To reinforce the cultural identity of the Caldo Assyrians of all denominations, the Assyrian Democratic Movement has set up newspapers, radio and television stations, even if they are makeshift. In northern Iraq, the local channel, Ashur TV, was the first channel to broadcast entirely in Aramaic. But lately, there have been problems. Islamists have moved into the village of Tel Kaif, originally entirely Christian. The thing is that 
The Catholic Chaldean clergy is not in favor of developing a strong national identity. For them, the essential is the religious identity. Thank you. In face of surrounding hostility, the nationalists and religious leaders have got together to demand a recognition of their cultural and linguistic rights. They are trying to curb the massive exodus to America, Europe or Australia of a people who now feel more and more like strangers in their own land. In 1994, a major event took place in Rome. The agreement on the nature of Christ between the Assyrian Church of the East, once known as the Nestorians, and the Catholic Church brought an end to centuries of reciprocal condemnation. The schisms of the 5th century were simply misunderstandings. Although in principle, the dogmatic difficulties are eliminated, in that we no longer speak of dogma or Christology, there are still some difficult problems, which I would say are psychological, that we must overcome, but it will take time. The Assyrian Church of the East sees itself as that of a specific people, which the Chaldeans, who are Catholic, refute. Agreement seems impossible. For them, the Church is the Assyrian community itself. They conceive their religion as an intrinsic part of their nation, which we find unacceptable, because our Church is not limited to a tribe, a community, or a nation. You know that, at its origin, the Church of the East was the first missionary church in the world. Even before Rome, we missionaries evangelized as far as China. Most of the Caldo-Assyrians are now dispersed all over the world. In the United States, there are hundreds of thousands living in the region of the Great Lakes or in California, and the Assyrian Patriarch himself lives in Chicago. Here, the convention of the Assyrian Americans National Federation takes place in Detroit. Yonadam Kana, president of the Assyrian Democratic Movement, has traveled worldwide for years to attain political and financial support for his people. After the fall of Saddam, he represents the Christians in the Iraqi Governing Council. During the American Convention, he participates in numerous conferences and debates focused on culture, identity, and above all, on a future which is increasingly threatened. 
Je m'appelle Juliana Jindo. My name is Juliana Jindo. I am a Syrian, Chaldean, Syriac singer. I say the three of them because for me, we have these three identities. But we are one. That is, I personally consider myself as an Assyrian, Chaldean, Syriac. As singers, we help to keep up the young people's interest in preserving our language and our traditions. Together with the politicians and the representatives of our religion. It's a very good occasion for young people to get to know each other. There are many marriages which result from these conventions. In the West, the material survival of everyone is guaranteed. But the risk now is that a successful integration will mean that the Caldo-Assyrian identity will gradually disappear. The word Caldo-Assyrian didn't mean much in Turkey for the Caldo-Assyrians. It simply meant Catholic Christians as we identified Chaldean with Christian. That was all. We didn't talk about the history, geography, the past. And Turkey has never recognized the Caldo-Assyrians as a minority. The Turks don't even know that the Caldo Assyrians exist. We discovered our history here. And we adopted the name of Assyro Chaldea here. A name which was used at the peace conference of 1920. A name which was officially recognized by France. And on the refugee cards of every Caldo Assyrian, there is written Refugee of Turkish nationality of Caldo Assyrian origin. Internet has revolutionized the situation. There now exist a multitude of Caldo Assyrian sites of every persuasion. Immediate exchanges with Russia, Iraq, or America have allowed this dispersed and landless people to create a virtual nation. All Caldo Assyrians speak the Aramaic language, but only a few of them know how to write it. It is for this reason that we found it very interesting to teach it to young people, and we are trying to make sure that we teach them the real version of the language. Since 1996, I have used textbooks from northern Iraq, written by Zawa Demokrataya, the Assyrian Democratic Movement. Zawa is very experienced in the use of the language and knows how to select the right Aramaic word for each situation. On the 29th of January 2001, the French National Assembly publicly recognized the Armenian Genocide. The Caldo Assyrians were not mentioned. In the face of modern-day Turkey, which still fiercely refuses to accept the term genocide and speaks only of casualties of war on both sides, every year the Caldo Assyrians take part in the Armenian protest march. The history of the 20th century had forgotten them. Their only hope is to see the 21st century finally recognize the tragedies in which they nearly disappeared. On a 
One has the impression that young people now, who are born and raised in France, see themselves more as French than Caldo-Assyrian. It is, of course, really discouraging to think that all I have done is for nothing. It's true that I have had moments like that. But in spite of everything, I say to myself, I must work, I must move forward, I must not become discouraged, I must resist, and I feel this almost daily. One must continue, one must resist, I must continue, because one day or another, history will hold us to account, we, the generation who came here. What have we done to maintain our identity? What have we done to maintain our culture. Hey, 